Hello, and welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name is David Stockdale. I'll be your host on this excursion into the dark unknown. This is the second installment in my Critical Approaches series, in which I have set out to analyze the surreal and enigmatic web series, Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. My goal with this series is to demonstrate how certain critical approaches can be applied to a work and hopefully show what can be gained from this sort of activity. In my first video, I went over the basics of formalism. I also took a look at the very first episode of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. I performed a close reading of sorts, basically a shot-by-shot -shot analysis of the material. My aim was to demonstrate how paying extremely close attention to a work like Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared can produce unique, meaningful, and perhaps even counterintuitive observations. Just to offer a bit of clarification on my previous video, I think I'd be misrepresenting the formalists if I suggested that they didn't acknowledge or reference the outside world at all in their analysis of a work. If you really think about the logical implications of such a view, I think you'll find that it's totally incoherent. And that's not quite what I'm getting at with the formal method. It's more so about how things are contextualized within the analysis of a work. Formalism is a methodical approach to analyzing a text which centralizes the quote-unquote work itself in an attempt to understand how the various components of a work come together in order to form a functioning whole. And I do generally think that viewing art in these terms has the capacity to produce some very profound insights. But as this series progresses, I should note that we'll be systematically broadening the critical analysis of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. And in doing so, I think we'll gain something by thinking of it in different terms altogether. In this installment, I'll be continuing my critical analysis of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. This time around, I'll be applying the literary theories of a certain notable thinker in order to unpack the work. Mikhail Bakhtin was a 20th century Russian philosopher, semiotician, and literary critic. He was one of the more lucid and innovative writers of his time. He was working in an era of unprecedented historical change, the shadow of the Russian Revolution and the onslaught of World War II. His critical approach is largely focused on examining the multitude of voices that exist within a text. This is what Bakhtin referred to as polyphony, a term he borrowed from music theory. So too did Bakhtin seek to parse out the tension between acceptable and unacceptable language, between the official and unofficial voices within a work. In Rabelais and His World, Bakhtin focused on a French novelist by the name of Francois Rabelais, specifically his novel Gargantua and Pantagruel. Bakhtin was fascinated by folk culture, the life world of the masses, whose influence he thought to be deeply and forcibly suppressed and criminally misrepresented in many works of literature. He focused on Rabelais' novel because he believed the work served as the best literary representation of this forgotten world. Notably, Bakhtin's critical work was not well received in the Soviet Union, perhaps in a time when the USSR enforced its own official party line Bakhtin's observations about the Renaissance social system and unpermitted language hit a little bit too close to home. In the prologue to the 1984 edition of Rabelais and His World, Michael Hallquist says of the work, The book is finally about freedom, the courage needed to establish it, the cunning required to maintain it, and above all, the horrific ease with which it can be lost. Bakhtin's focus on the lower strata of society, as opposed to the ruling class, is a solid heuristic starting point, and I believe his critical approach will uncover some very interesting things going on in Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Specifically, I'd like to focus on two of Bakhtin's major contributions to literary theory. Carnival, which Bakhtin regards as a social institution, and the grotesque body, which he regards as a literary trope. Bakhtin saw within Rabelais' writing the most representative instance of both carnival and the grotesque body in the sense of folk culture. Because of this, he called Rabelais' novel the most fearless book in world literature. Bakhtin's conception of carnival entails the ritualistic sort of reversal in power dynamics that occurred during various popular festivals in the Middle Ages, in which, for instance, the jester was made king. In addition, it was appropriate to ridicule the king or clergy. Thus, the spirit of carnival opens up a space for dialogue to potentially occur. 
it challenges the status quo. And while the carnival spirit of folk culture was suppressed over time, Bakhtin asserted that the quote-unquote carnival principle was indestructible. For Bakhtin, the grotesque body is about degradation, taking that which has been idealized, propped up as heavenly, and bringing it back down to earth. The grotesque body was a subversion of the dominant ideology at the time. The human body was commonly depicted as whole and pure, separate from the outside world. By contrast, grotesque imagery depicts the body as incomplete, part of the larger world. The grotesque body entails the gratification of bodily needs, such as the overindulgence of food and drink, as well as the explicit depiction of bodily functions, such as urination and defecation, in addition to certain exaggerated body parts. Bakhtin says such imagery evokes the ambivalent laughter of the people. He thought that this laughter had a regenerative power. It would perhaps be appropriate to think of laughter here in a distinct therapeutic context, a way to work through the very real and serious problems of life. Bakhtin emphasized that the use of the grotesque body in both Rabelais' work and folk culture itself should not be interpreted based on the norms of modern day society but rather understood on its own terms. He noted that the grotesque body is not merely gross naturalism, but rather an essential component of folk culture. And from the grotesque body, we get a literary mode called grotesque realism, a quote, system of images created by the medieval culture of folk humor, which reached its height in the Renaissance. Bakhtin asserted that the true nature of the grotesque body was gradually distorted in literature throughout the ages as folk culture was suppressed, and thus its connection to the grotesque in literary forms was largely severed. In the romantic phase, we see exemplifications of grotesque realism, which tend to resemble its original form, or at least retain some essential features, but in other ways divert wildly in character. The manner in which madness is contextualized is, for instance, a point of thematic divergence. The use of grotesque imagery in folk culture frames madness in contrast to the prevailing or dominant perspective. It's someone who doesn't think like other people. It's a festive sort of madness, an eschewing of official reason. In the romantic phase, however, madness developed into an individualized and tragic condition, associated with isolation, a private affair. This sharp individuation, or perhaps it would be better to say atomization of tropes in certain literary modes, is immediately relevant to my analysis of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, specifically with respect to the way grotesque images are employed within the series. Bakhtin differentiates the literary notion of carnival from the formal parody associated with the rise of modernity, which he says operates through mere negation rather than working to rebuild. Folk culture denies, Bakhtin asserts, but it revives and renews at the same time. In its best iterations, literary works in this realm capture a sense of potentiality, the death of the old world and the possibility of a new one death and renewal. In simple terms, we might consider Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared to be a parody of children's programming, shows like Sesame Street. But I don't think that's the whole story. The series doesn't merely tear down or lambast a genre. One would be hard pressed to say children's programming is really even the true object of ridicule in this case. I don't think it is. Given the narrative arc of the series, there is very clearly something larger at play. As we delve further into Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, I must first acknowledge the formal distinction between the novel, the object of Bakhtin's study, and the series of short films that constitute Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Formalism regards language as a semiotic code, an elaborate system of signs used to convey meaning. Of course, in the case of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, the work operates not through the prose form, but rather through the multitude of sensual components that constitute a film. The language of film is not simply a matter of words, but rather a multifaceted set of systems that interact with one another, a cross-section of sound and images. Now, as I've previously noted, there are certain topics that tend to be considered outside the scope of a strict formal analysis. 
Topics such as historical context or biographical information about the creators is typically considered outside the bounds of a formal analysis. But as we pivot to a broader consideration of the material, we have to consider how this filmic language exists not within some abstract vacuum, but in the circulation of everyday life. And that necessarily entails a concerted focus on both the life world that produces a work and the life world in which said work is received. With respect to the life world in which Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared was produced, Well, it wasn't all that long ago, so I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I have some kind of unique perspective. But I will say that we live in a time when the dominant works of satire have themselves become rigid institutions of sorts. Shows like The Simpsons and South Park, for instance, have become fixed entities in the media landscape, constants in a world of uncertainty. As such, they can't really offer a transgressive critique of the dominant perspectives in society. In a sense, these shows actually help constitute the dominant ideological perspectives of our time. They reinforce the status quo. I would say this has absolutely been the case for at least the last 10 to 20 years. In its worst executions, these satire-oriented works create vacuous opponents to tear down and lambast, rather than offer an incisive critique on some real social dynamic. It's performative satire, as opposed to substantive. It's the epitome of satire, really. I would say this occurs in part due to the economic imperative to keep making fresh content. With this in mind, we might consider Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared to be the horrific and surreal answer to the problem posed by modern day satire. Irony, in the conventional sense of the word, is employed with a very specific function in the work. It works in service of a larger narrative arc. Ambiguity plays an important role as well, one which I believe has been vastly underestimated in the various interpretations I've come across. And on that note, with respect to the life world in which Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared has been received, I get a sense that there's a certain perspective on the work that has become dominant, the so-called media theory, which I might add is not even necessarily something I disagree with. But due to the way in which the media landscape and in particular the YouTube ecosystem operates, there is a strong economic imperative to deliver a steady stream of content, thus limiting the degree to which any one particular topic can really be researched and discussed in depth. So too has a sort of inequitable dynamic come about, an environment in which a select few people are able to dominate the conversation and thus their views become the dominant perspective. This is no one person's fault, let alone the YouTubers who create commentary videos of this kind. But we should keep in mind the sort of incentives that exist within our current system are not necessarily conducive to genuine dialogue. These factors have led to a distinct kind of homogeneity with respect to how the series has been interpreted. And because of that, I really have my work cut out for me in terms of offering my own take on the work. The process of critical dialogue should be democratic, meaning everyone who wants to take part is able to have a voice. That's what I believe. But there's been a sort of hardening of the arteries, as it were, with respect to how this bizarre work has been interpreted. But ironically enough, the work seems to admonish this very dynamic. There's a certain unmistakable openness to the series, an ambiguous quality that continually drives people to keep talking about it. For instance, there is an ambivalent nature to the trippy interlude in the very first episode. We might construe the movements of these characters as involuntary fits, or we might construe them as dancing. Who's to say, really? In some sense, the series defies categorization. And because of that, the work is in large part impervious to the sort of speculation that operates at the level of your run-of-the-mill fan theory. And it is immune, in certain respects, to a homogenous understanding of the work. Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared undermines dogmatism at nearly every turn. In simple terms, the work lays bare the horrific process of ideological indoctrination. 
And by doing so, it instills a sort of anti-authoritarian attitude towards certain restrictive ways of thinking. As you might recall from my first video on the topic, there is a very distinct kind of authoritative voice that pervades the first episode of the series, namely that of the notepads. There are various instances in which the notepad employs tautological statements in order to get a certain point across. For instance, in order to be creative, one needs to think creatively. I would say it's not quite the words themselves that matter here, but rather the juxtaposition of circular reasoning and the exertion of authority as evidenced by certain otherworldly demonstrations of power. In other words, the tautology used by the notepad to define and rationalize a certain view of creativity is not merely about creativity. It's about demonstrating to the other characters that the notepad has the ability to dictate the bounds of discourse, forcibly if necessary, with respect to how any given word is defined. This is, of course, despite the notepad not being willing or perhaps able to offer a coherent rational argument for that view. The otherworldly demonstration of force is itself the justification. Might makes right. Put simply, the ideological rationale for certain oppressive norms in this fictional universe is as follows. It is what it is. This is an idiom that I would assert is antithetical to the process of critical thinking. And if you go against the official dogma relayed by the central figures in each episode of the series, bad things happen. This elaborate and, more importantly, magical show of force is, in some ways, analogous to the discourse surrounding the work itself. It is an artistic representation of the dominant modes of interpretation. Modes which not only purport to uncover some hidden meaning, to fully explain what's happening in a work, as it were, but to present an attention-grabbing spectacle in the process of doing so. And the attention generated from this spectacle is itself a sort of justification for the interpretation. This otherworldly exertion of authority is the literal embodiment of might makes right or, in other words, the self-justifying logic of power. It is certainly no coincidence that many children's books and TV shows employ the use of carnival imagery. The festive upheaval of the social order is, in a general way, every kid's idea of fun. The conventional rules, so to speak, are temporarily suspended. Systems of hierarchy are, for a short time, ritualistically reversed. The order of things is turned on its head. And so, in consideration of the fact that, at least in a surface level way, Don't Hug Me I'm Scared is a play on children's programming, it only makes sense that we can very clearly observe the implicit suggestion of carnivalesque dynamics in the work. In a select few instances, Don't Hug Me I'm Scared depicts the carnivalization process, but strangely, it uses carnival dynamics to reinforce rather than subvert certain, one might say, oppressive social norms. This is its effect on the main characters. But in doing so, the work demonstrates to the viewers the regressive spectacle of indoctrination and the backwards logic of self-justified authority. In each installment of the series, a parodic caricature of the authoritative figure teaches some lesson. Importantly, these entities are not immediately identified as figures of authority. Rather, they're presented as innocuous items which have magically come to life. I would say it's a scenario somewhat akin to a teacher who tries to get on the level of their students and pretend that they're all just friends having a conversation. It is, in a sense, faux carnival dynamics. But in each case, the veil is lifted in a horrific fashion and the true power dynamic becomes clear. In some ways, these figures serve a role that is antithetical to that of the fools depicted in literature. While fools often point out the hypocrisy of the ruling class, the authority figures in Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared are the embodiment of hypocrisy itself. The fundamental goal of each lesson is to uphold certain norms. I would assert that these norms are fundamentally hierarchical in nature. The lesson of the first installment on creativity is to discourage creativity, critical thinking, or free thought.
There is a certain comic effect achieved through the work's juxtaposition of children's programming and the deep existential horror evoked by its grotesque depictions. In Rabelais and His World, Bakhtin finds a connection between grotesque images and the passage of time throughout medieval and Renaissance literature. Images of the body in all its grotesque aspects were strongly associated with the cyclical passage of time, the changing of the seasons, the life cycle, etc. Though this depiction of temporality in literature changed over time, and so too did the general depictions of the grotesque body in literature change with it. Time became not just an association with the general processes of natural cycles, but a process of social and historical flux. Bakhtin links the artist's awareness to historical change with the Renaissance, undoubtedly a time of great change. With this in mind, it is essential to note that the use of grotesque imagery in Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared is distinct from Bakhtin's conception of the grotesque body. It is unique to the historical moment in which Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared was created. Though the use of grotesque imagery in Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared is notably distinct from Bakhtin's conception of the grotesque body, we can observe something of an inverse relationship here. Rather than employ Bakhtin's notion of the grotesque body to degrade or bring certain social conceits back down to earth, so to speak, the series actually uses grotesque imagery to create horrific abstractions. Abstractions which serve to systematically atomize and neutralize the main characters. Towards the end of the first video, we see a foreboding image. The bird spells out death in oozing black paint. This image prefigures the lesson of the second episode, the subject of which is purportedly time. Though I think the lesson is really about death. To be sure, it is a traumatic experience, one that is, in a certain sense, removed from the concept of death itself. The manner in which death is contextualized within the lesson is horrific. There's a layer of ideological abstractions at play. The concept of death here is not merely the cessation of the body's processes, but rather all the horrific existential baggage that comes with it. Similarly, the passage of time is thematically linked with the grotesque image of bodily decay. The real purpose of the lesson, I would say, is not only to instill within the characters an immediate sense of their own mortality, but to make them scared as shit in the process. To make death a fundamentally scary thing. In episode 5, grotesque imagery is employed in conjunction with food so as to lower the sterile and pedagogical discussion of nutrition to a base level. In a sense, the goal of the lesson is to atomize the remaining characters, to isolate them so as to make them weak, divide and conquer. This is achieved by manipulating the yellow guy into consuming the bird in a ritualistic fashion. This is quite obviously the true source of horror in the episode. Interestingly, the scene is prefigured in episode 3 when the bird opens up his picnic basket to reveal a pile of raw chicken legs. The horror in this instance is twofold. First, it is evoked through the imagery of raw food. It is the dining experience laid bare for us. And second, it is the subtle implication that the bird character is about to eat his own kind. Whereas in a festival associated with the carnival spirit, people would overindulge in meat and alcohol, Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared turns the act of eating into a shameful thing, a maligned and horrific process of consumption. Now, this particular scene in episode three is an apt example of what Bakhtin would refer to as a ritual spectacle. In the fictional universe of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, we might construe this as some kind of cultish indoctrination ceremony. Many have interpreted the scene in this way, and that's all well and good. But I'd be remiss not to point out the distinctly carnivalesque nature of the arrangement here. Our yellow friend is ceremoniously placed on a throne made of clouds, a position of high regard, royalty. Recall that previously in the very first episode, the yellow guy was routinely admonished for demonstrating his own creativity. And the manner in which this was done was prolonged and otherworldly. It is one instance in which the true power dynamic of this world makes itself apparent. The yellow guy is not an authority in this universe. He doesn't get to decide what creativity is. 
And yet, in episode three, the yellow guy is placed on a throne. Of course, it's very quickly made apparent that this is not a voluntary situation, but there is an elaborate and ritualistic form of role reversal going on here that I think perfectly encapsulates the pervasive and very peculiar use of carnival dynamics throughout the work. What is happening, I believe, is that a carnival dynamic is being performed so as to lure the characters into a state of openness. The ritual is designed to lower the yellow guy's defenses, to make him feel important so that he'll acquiesce to the worldview of those in power. This series of lessons is presented to the characters as though learning these key concepts, the topics covered, will be beneficial. Knowledge is power, after all. The surface layer of the work regards the characters as willful participants in a series of educational activities that will lead to their empowerment. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. These lessons are cruel, abusive attempts to indoctrinate the characters. As such, the series instills a sort of critical reflection with respect to certain lessons in our own lives. That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. If you enjoy my videos and have a few bucks to spare, please consider supporting me on ko-fi.com forward slash Nightmare Masterclass. Any amount, large or small, is highly appreciated. Thank you for watching, and good night.